help us discover new biology in cancer as well as apply some of the uh, new technology into translational research to potentially help the clinical uh, management of cancer patients. So that's where I come from. So just a very quick introduction of my background. So I uh, <coughs> was trained as an engineer uh, back in China probably uh, 15 years ago, and I got my PhD also in engineering, electrical computer engineering from U of I uh, 10 years ago. And I then subsequently uh, switch, uh, kind of a switch to bioinformatics field because I was interested more in discovery rather than just uh, developing systems. And I worked for Washington University Genome Center for about six years as a senior scientist and research faculty before I moved to MD Anderson in 2011, where I started to run in my own research group and to collaborate with clinicians to, uh, to, to, do, uh, to do research. So my current research area covers human genetics uh, very broadly, which uh, basically looking at different uh, populations of, uh, and their genomes, trying to identify factors which contribute to different disease and also focus much more on cancer genomics than I was before and now moving towards translation and, and clinical genomics because the MD Anderson provide a nice environment where I can kind of look at those problems. So in the past 10 years, I kind of, uh, I can break into two parts. One is uh, before 2011, I was, when I was at WashU, where I was involved in a lot of uh, uh, large scale genome, can, uh, genome sequencing projects like TCGA 1000 genome project and also this pediatric cancer genome project with uh, St. Jude. Uh, institution and I, and those projects gave me a lot of opportunity to think about how we should design computational algorithms or bioinformatics to enable the discovery from very large uh, genomic sequence and data. And consequently, I developed quite a few uh, bioinformatics tools and some of those uh, gets relatively widely used now in different uh, cancer uh, genomic laboratories. And in after I joined MD Anderson, I was more involved in the so-called Institute of Personalized Cancer Therapy, which is about apply genomics into our routine cancer treatment, which I'll get into more details a little later. And I also involved in International Cancer Genome Consortium Project, which is a continuation of TCGA, but it's more international scale. And same pattern, uh, I have been developing a few more tools as they field move forward which I think will be more so more translational than discovery uh, per se. So today I'm going to probably talk about, I think I should be able to cover at least two of the computational approach I uh, recently developed. I hope I will be able to cover the third one, but we'll, we'll see how, how fast I can, I can speak. So uh, a little bit uh, more background. So this is the IPCT, MD Anderson Hollyfer Institute for in, uh, Personalized Cancer Therapy. Uh, short for uh, IPCT. This was an institution established about five years ago where uh, the mission is to basically uh, provide, try to provide personalized cancer therapy for all the patients. And, uh, and very naturally, they, because of the development in the next generation sequencing, so next generation sequencing has been, been one of the primary uh, molecular characterization platform which has been sort of routinely applied to a large number of patients uh, so we can you know include those information in clinical decision making uh, later on and another important I think aspect is to construct a knowledge base uh, at uh, basically a very high resolution base pair resolution for each individual mutation if a patient contain one particular mutation are we able to basically act to that type of uh, information and how accurate, how feasible that information is going to basically reshape the clinical care that is going on now. So for this second initiative, I actually have a lot of, uh, not a whole lot, but uh, uh, collaboration with uh, faculties in this department, uh, particularly Trevor and uh, Omer and also Hua and also some uh, with Jim. And <coughs> so uh, as I just talked about the, uh, the genomic platform which has been used in the IPCT is this sort of a targeted sequence and panel which consists of uh, about 300, 200 to 300 
relevant genes, cancers, uh, rele uh, genes relevant to cancer, and we're, tr we're using a sort of a DNA capture technique. Rather than sequence the whole genome of the cancer uh, DNA, we're just capture important regions where we already have a prior knowledge those regions might be matter to the, uh, to the patient management. And this uh, needs to be done in a fairly standard way. So the quality of the data as well as the analysis can be very standard. And then the information can hopefully be passed to uh, patients at some point or clinicians. And they can basically trust that type of information and understand what that information means. So they can potentially apply that uh, to clinical decision making. And at the same time, another uh, important component of this is the so-called functional geno genomic platform, uh, which was a basic headed by Gordon Mills and Ken Scott at uh, Baylor College of Medicine. So this platform is important because, as we know, we, it's easier to identify mutations in cancer tissue now, but it's very hard to understand the function of those particular mutations. So this. Uh, functional genomic platform uh, basically consists several components. For example, it consists of cell line uh, screening platform where you can basically using a lentivirus to transfect a particular type of cell line and measure the viability of the cell line given a particular mutation you are interested. And also there's a, of course there's a, for lots of uh, functionality, you could, could use shRNA to basically turn off the expression of certain genes, for example. So, and I also have a other type of platform I'm not going to get into details. For example, like protein omic platform RPPA to basically measure the protein activity of certain, uh, in, in the cancer tissue given some sort of a, some mutation or some uh, aberration in the, in the cell. So that's, uh, this system is uh, trying to scale up to be able to measure, uh, you know, tens or hundreds of uh, mutations per week. That was the initial uh, objective, but I think this has been uh, more difficult than we originally thought, but it's still a very important component of, the, uh, of, this, uh, of this initiative. And for example, one type of data produced by this type of functional genomic platform is, uh, is like, like this. So this is a gene called PIX3CA. Uh, some of you know is this is uh, known as the uncle gene in uh, a set of tumor. Uh, uh, for example, breast cancer has a lot of uh, PIX3CA mutations. And we're able to look at different positions in this particular protein and measure the functionality of, of a mutation of each of those individual mutations. As you can see, there's a potentially a highly functional mutation at this location, 545 and the asset location, and if you have a mutation at this particular location, you might have a stronger oncogenic functionality than you have a mutation at a different location. So we're able to basically look at each individual positions in the oncogenes to be able to tease out what are the potential functionality, yes. Uh, recurrence, uh, what, what is that? Yeah, this is a, how frequent this mutation has been observed in the cosmic database. So as you know, more frequent the mutation happens in some cancer patients, the more likely they are going to be functional just by part definition of positive selection. In, uh, but that's not always the case. Sometimes some hotspots, some positions tend to have more mutations just because of the mutation rate variation, not necessarily because of the disease uh, phenotype. So, so therefore, this is uh, going to be a complex landscape and it's not going to be very, uh, predictable using a simple approach. So therefore, experimental data like this is going to potentially serve as a good uh, training data sets for any computational approach. So, I'm kind of wondering, so <laughs> this observation might be, say, in a, it could be outcome, or it could be the driver, right? That's that right? So we observe a lot of, say, Say whatever process right. the cells go through, as long as you become cancer, you have that. Yeah. Or it could be say you know wherever cells, if you become cancer, you have that. So either way. Mm -hmm. So of course, when you accumulate a mutation, 
the mutational landscape will change every time if that mutation has a function, basically. Presumably, some mutation, let's say, in mismatch repair gene, will basically trigger hyper mutator phenotype as, as an example. So, uh, whenever you, uh, so this is uh, always an uh, evolving landscape in terms of a uh, potential functionality. Uh, so therefore, uh, it's a hard problem, as you know. I think for this type of experiment, it's uh, it's it's well controlled. Basically, we're looking at a given a, a set of cell line which has been very well characteristic, both genomically as well as uh, in terms of their phenotype, certain degree. And we always have controlled experiments side by side. Uh, for example, we only measure one mutation and always compare with the wild type, the wild type, and those sort of things. So, I mean, it's it's. I know it's still a complicated thing, right? I mean, the, the under control environment, this is not how, how much translational value this is going to be in reality is still questionable. But at least this provides us some information to basically being able to further prioritize which mutations are more important than other mutations. And so, uh, <coughs> am I understanding correctly that HPI is a mutation? And the higher yeah. the pi's are on the reference scale, the more important we think they are. Yeah. Yeah, and the color representing the functionality, basically how many cells survived after the, you know, the so dependency or, yeah. The more red or orange or whatever that color is, yeah. the, the, the more effective, shall we say, mutation. Right. So the K and the R on no. the, the top of the scale are the two most important mutations. Right. Okay. Uh, you observe all liars like this. This is not very highly recurrent, but it's still a relatively strong mutation based on this functional asset, right? So this is not going to be a smooth uh, uh, landscape as I described. So one of the thing I, uh, you know, several of you here, we were basically uh, work together is to try to look at whether we can automate the data analysis to some extent where we can, uh, I think at this stage it's fair to say we're trying to explore uh, what's the value of this type of approach applied to a relatively large scale? We're talking about apply some sort of informatics uh, pipeline to tens of thousands of uh, cancer patient MD Anderson, and we're going to collect molecular data from all of those patients, and we're trying to go through this uh, data informatics pipeline process, including a lot of prior knowledge which we can learn uh, from potential from this department, let's say. Uh, and through so biomedical bio literature mining and other uh, very sophisticated technique, and whether we can come up with a better decision, or make it, maybe we can assist clinician to make a better decision to a particular treatment. So that's was our grant uh, a few years ago, <laughs> actually. <laughs> and my uh, position in this grant is this patient molecular profile, just so uh, pointing out. And one important uh, uh, aspect, as I talked in my uh, second slides, is we're trying to construct a knowledge base. So this is one of the products. It's called Personalized Cancer Therapy uh, publicly available. I think it's primarily developed by a group of. Uh, uh, I, I think it's a collaboration between the uh, actually several faculty here and the, a group of uh, uh, medical uh, scientists at MD Anderson. And I think there's a mixture of automatic approach, natural language processing approach, in combination with a lot of manual review uh, to come up with this highly curated database. Basically, for any given mutation, what are the functional or clinical evidence that is existing in the literature? Can we basically prioritize that information into, quant quantify that information into different level of uh, uh, importance and try to basically sort of bring some rules or you know, regularity into this highly you know, complicated uh, situation. So, so I think say, this number may be outdated. Uh, I think the number of genes curated has probably more than 24 now, and the individual variants curated is probably more than 500 by this time, just to give you a sense of scale. Okay, so that's the background I had, and I'm going to talk about hopefully three different computational approach for you to get the concept, what I do and what my research group does at MD Anderson. Uh, I may not get into a lot of uh, details. So 
First, I'd like to talk about this uh, problem where we want to detect mutation from the genome sequencing data. As I talk about, this is uh, the first part of our pipeline where we get genome, patient genome sequenced through targeted capture uh, for the most situation. And we want to know, we want to know what are the mutations that exist in a patient cancer genome but not in the normal genome whether those mutations has uh, clinical uh, implications. So this is a, as we know, uh, we, we've been working with uh, clinicians under this setting. Uh, myself has been working in this setting many years, and I know clinicians don't like a very long list of mutations because oftentimes most of them does not have a biological or reliable clinical uh, interpretation, and they are very busy, right? They only have five minutes potentially looking at this type of information. So therefore, I know their expectation is basically something short and relatively simple and clear. For example, this is a report from uh, Foundation Medicine, which is a, is a company which uh, performs uh, genomic testing of cancer tissues. For this particular patient, they identify about seven potentially actionable mutations, and three of, five of them are actually copy number amplification, and two of them are mutation, this is a potential missense, this is a slight side mutation. And for each of those, they wanted to have a potential uh, drug, which they want to uh, have an explanation of the actionability of those uh, mutations, including what are the drugs that can target those particular mutations. And whether there, there are clinical trials available which specifically uh, target those mutations or the, or the genes involved affected by those mutations. So this is the expression of clinician. However, uh, for people who has working on genomics for a while, the approach applied is very sophisticated because it, just like uh, any other domain, genomics itself is a very complicated thing. Human genome has three billion base pairs, it's very big. And the mutation could happen anywhere in the genome. And Cancer tissue is highly complicated. It's, it's, it's a mixture of millions of cells. It could coming from different type of uh, you know, tissue and uh, you could have uh, tumor and normal mixed together, for example. So how do we reliably read out the mutation that are specific to the cancer tissue and it's going to occur uh, you know, precisely at a particular location? That by itself is a very uh, computational challenge problem. So they, Cancer genomic community, a particular computational cancer genomics uh, community has developed a set of uh, tools. Those are, those are all heavy computation intensive tools to look at this type of data. And oftentimes, this is uh, basically a big data challenge. As you know, uh, I, I already mentioned the genome itself is three billion base pair, and we often have to sequence the genome multiple times, uh, 30, 50, 100 times. That's already uh, very big amount of data, and you won't be able to handle this with R or MATLAB, for example. You really have to be able to program in uh, some low-level language, C or you know, Perl, let's say, uh, to be able to do this type of analysis. And it costs a lot of uh, compute power to analyze that type of data. Oftentimes, uh, you know, tens of hours or multiple days, uh, it's uh, very, uh, very normal. And the end result is a lot of uncertainty, as I just talked about. Normally, you get hundreds of, even sometimes thousands of mutations, potential somatic mutations from tumor tissue. And only a handful of them are, is going to be matter uh, to our current knowledge to the clinic, clinical, uh, clinical decision making. So this is not a very efficient system, not very cost effective. Uh, we did this when we just come here, uh, regardlessly, because this has a power to discover new mutations, right? This has no prior uh, information of where the mutation is going to occur. So even though it's a very cost, uh, uh, cost in, uh, in, inefficient, we still did this. And this is a, sort of a snapshot of the different computational pipeline we need to put together. And we need to automate this in a sort of a, in a high throughput, in a high performance computing environment where the job dependency were able to properly schedule it. And this is going to be done with limited, very small manual in, uh, intervention in the process. And at the end of this uh, you know, engineering process, to process one patient uh, sample, we frequently take more than 24 hours. 
and each patient will have uh, used 50 gigabytes of uh, storage hard uh, disk space. And we still not only produce a lot of uh, variants which we don't know their, their importance, and we we'll still miss some important variants. Actually, we potentially miss a lot. Yes? So, um, over 24 hours, is that, how yeah. much of that is compute time, and how much of that is actually person time? This is uh, entirely compute time. All compute Person time costs a lot more, and the oftentimes communication is the, you know, the biggest issue, and uh, when the data come out of, uh, of tissue bank, going into the guys who's uh, making the library extract DNA, that itself, uh, probably take a lot more time, uh, tens, ten times more, you know, than this compute hour by itself. So we're actually uh, not doing bad in terms of compute hour, but uh, uh, but there's still room for further improve this this aspect. So, how, uh, so that compute time, how, <coughs> how many hours of person time, or how much person time per, per yeah. patient sample do you get? I think it's some point we will we'll get to even faster at that point. I think at some point we were even faster at that point. Uh, uh, I think the turnaround time from the patient enter uh, to, from the biopsy of the patient to the clinician getting the mutation data, uh, I think would be at a scale of uh, two months. And I think foundation medicine or some other commercial entity could pr presumably do it slightly faster in some situation, but it still will take a month. Uh, uh, on average, that's my, my understanding. So it's uh, still not a very fast uh, process, but most of it's not because of technology, it's because of the system uh, or they were not set up for this type of uh, uh, exercise at this point. And it's going to take a long time for the culture uh, shift to happen. So one of the things we, we feel like we can do is basically alter the workflow in the genomic data analysis process. Since we already know a lot of those variants are not going to be utilized, why don't we just focus on several variants which we know their translational impact, right? As I uh, just talked about, we, we already have a database which consists of uh, several hundred of uh, mutations. We clearly know their, we have a better understanding of their potential uh, clinical impact in, in, the, in different cancer types. We already have that database. So let's just target mutations in that database, right? Basically, as a way to uh, make to reduce the computational cost. So this is a system we uh, program which called CleanSick. We developed about two years ago. Basically, the core idea here is rather than analyze the entire three billion base pair, let's just analyze 500 nucleotide positions, right, in the genome. So while this and we discuss information which is not relevant to the 500 locations because that's, we know, is what the clinician like to see in the end. It's going to be useful anyway, that's the part. Uh, this, you know, this is not actually as trivial as you might think because there's a couple of issues. Basically, we're, we're, we, we need to tolerate errors, basically. That's the first uh, uh, challenge because a mutation side by itself is not, uh, potentially have uh, polymorphisms near the mutation. <coughs> and there's going to be sequence of errors in the data by itself. So we cannot just do perfect exact match, we'll be, which would be a very easy computational problem, <coughs> right? So we need to have a system which will be able to tolerate uh, some, some amount of error in the, in the, in the search. And we'll, we'll need to be able to, uh, even though we only analyze 500, locations, we should not rule out possibility of this data might come in from a different location in the genome, right? So because genome is so fast, there's a repeats, repetitive region in the genome. So if we mistakenly uh, put, place some data in our site of interest, we might get false positives. So those are two critical computational challenges involved. So we have to design the system in a very uh, careful and precise way. That's what we did. In this situation, I'm not going to get into details. It actually involves uh, re-implementation of uh, alignment uh, algorithms uh, of reads to a set of a reference, very highly uh, curated reference, consists of only the target as well as surrogates from region of uh, potential uh, confusing uh, region of the genome. So we did this, 
And we were able to compare, uh, measure the improvement we were able to achieve. Basically, we were able to align a subset, a small subset of reads better than standard aligners like BWA or some other algorithm. And for example, some example here, we're particularly better at aligning information which appear at the end of the reads. Those are potentially false positive uh, locations were able to uh, align those better uh, in many situations. Again, I'm not going to get into details. It's not the primary interest of this group. So we're able to validate our approach in comparison with two uh, frequently used approach in the community. One is called VALSCAN, two, the other one is called MUTEC, developed by the Broad Institute. And we're able to, from 1,000 tumor cases identify nine mutations which were missed by both of the other algorithms. So this is not, even though this is not a huge number, out of 1,000 cases, we only find nine misses by other algorithms. But if you look at the potential impact to individual patients, this could be uh, very big. Out of the nine mutations uniquely identified by this program, uh, six of the cases were the only actionable mutation of those patients. So otherwise, it, it, without this information, those six patients will be basically, the clinician wouldn't have this information to be useful for those, those patients. And, and importantly, uh, we were able to use, speed up this process basically 80 times faster and use 20 times less storage. So this is going to be something very uh, petite. Two, 200 times storage, yeah. less storage, yes. Yeah. Oh, I said 20, sorry. <laughs> You're underselling. Okay, okay, uh, thanks. <laughs> thanks for helping. <laughs> so, uh, importantly, we're, we're kind of like thinking about potentially this can be uh, something that we can, uh, we already put it uh, online, but upon proper education of uh, the user groups, potentially this is something can be used by patients themselves. Because this, can, this thing can be run on laptop computers with about 30 minutes to analyze the data we, we analyze for, you know, let's say uh, 24 hours, as I described previously, on high co performance computer. Uh, we have an actual theorist explore, so this is basically a dream. I think this is where I like the program to move into. Maybe someday the patient can basically download this program and look at their own data and look at the 500 important mutations which will occur in their own cancer, I think that might be a powerful way to, to go, go forward. Okay, so this was published in Genomic Medicine about, oh, actually only last year, okay. Program was developed two years ago and it's available in uh, Bitbucket and, this, and people are encouraged to, to try, yes. So let's say tomorrow we discover that you know, 50 of the genes that yeah. are on this list are no longer important and another 50, how hard would it be to? Yeah. Uh, you basically, the first step is to build your library. So you can always uh, include more mutation or exclude, uh, you know, useless mutations into your library. So that's, uh, that's only need to build once and then you can apply to as many genomes as possible. So it's all automated and it's included in this package. So what is, uh, what is involved in, in creating a library for a gene? So you just need the genomic coordinates of those eight genes. Let's say we download, you go to the personalized cancer therapy dialog and you start to look at uh, which mutations are there and you figure out the genomic coordinates of those genes. So I have a program next to tell you. And then you just make a little text file with the, you know, chromosome one, this position, which let's say you list eight of those important mutations. And you run our program, you will automatically build into a library. And then you can just uh, apply to your big, big data, big genomic data on your laptop, probably. Okay. So while we are dealing with this type of uh, problem, uh, let's see, what, uh, what's the time? Uh, uh, okay, about 15, 20 minutes. Uh, the second program I'm going to talk about is called TransVar. This is a multi-level annotator for precision genomics. So while we were doing this, uh, one of the important steps is to basically annotate the genomic mutation we identified 
uh, into the protein, uh, say, uh, mRNA at protein level as a way to understand whether this mutation is going to affect uh, protein. Uh, you know, maybe it's a substitution of amino acids, maybe it's going to affect, uh, you're going to introduce a truncation of the protein, for example, those sort of things. So this is a standard, standardized uh, procedure which we'll, we will call for annotation and lots of tools has been developed to automate this process. And as you know, the uh, challenge here is uh, because each uh, gene potentially can be translated into different uh, product. Uh, there's an alternative splicing involved. Different set of exon of this gene can be ex expressed into different uh, mRNA transcript and consequently being expressed into a different protein product. So therefore, there's a one to many relationship involved. One mutation could be expressed in multiple uh, protein isoforms of fact. So, so be able to uh, completely represent this process. Uh, let's say uh, a program that performs for annotation should basically take an input, which is a genomic mutation on chromosome seven, this location, a uh, base T gets uh, you know, substituted by a base C. To be able to take this information and being able to output which gene this mutation is in and which are the transcript and protein isoforms. Uh, if this mutation affects this isoform, it's going to create what type of uh, downstream uh, effect, most likely a protein substitution, for example, simple, single amino acid substitution. So you need to be able to encode this entire string of information to be able to uniquely uh, specify this process. However, as you can see, this is a highly uh, not very user friendly, particularly to clinicians. So oftentimes what happens is the clinician is going to drop this middle parts, right? The transcript and the isoform information which were involved to, for this, in this translation are going to be dropped. So when this information gets into a clinician's hands or frequently in biomedical literature, gets in biomedical literature, what left over is only a gene and a protein location and amino acid a substitution information, but without those intermediate set, step. So that's where the information gets lost it, right? Basically, as you can see, this creates uh, a problem. So for example, when we're trying to compare two databases, let's say Cosmic is a database of our somatic mutations by Sanger Institute, and TZG or the, uh, you, know, as you know, the recent project which identified lots of mutations. If we are trying to compare those two databases, Oh, uh, we frequently gets into uh, you know uh, troubles. For example, we know this mutation, EGFR mutation, is a highly recurring mutation in cosmic. It actually is a predictor of tyrosine kinase resistance. However, we were not able to find this mutation in TCGA, which is a very uh, weird situation because we know this is highly recurrent. What happened is because TCGA groups has been Select, uh, annotate this mutation using a different isoform, right? As I said, there's an alternative splicing. So Cosmic group and TCGA groups have been using different isoform to annotate this mutation. So in TCGA, the same mutation is actually gets represented as a, at a different amino acid location in the same gene. That's the reason why we could not find this uh, mutation in TCGA data sets. And verse versa, if we have a we found a highly recurrent mutation in TCGA non carcinoma, where we felt, felt like this is likely a potential driver mutation. However, when we look at the Cosmic database, we were not able to find this mutation in Cosmic. So that's also a uh, you know, surprise. What happened again is because two different databases have been using different sort of a language or different uh, transcript to, to, to encode those information. So this created a lot of uh, a problem to research. It's not actually a small problem because what if this is actually a driver mutation? We might miss this uh, opportunity to identify those drivers. So if we look at the, uh, the entire data sets, we have found 18% of TCGA mutation as they were reported in the Nature paper were actually not found in Cosmic. If we only look at the protein information but not look at the genomic, I mean genomic coordinates when available would uniquely identify the mutation, but if we only have the protein information, then 80% of those information won't match across two different databases. Okay, so this 
பைசா பைசா கேட் ப்ரெசன்ஸ் அ ப்ராப்ளம் டு அஸ் அண்ட் வி லைக் டு சால்வ் திஸ் ப்ராப்ளம் ஸோ இஃப் வி லுக் அட் வாட்ஸ் அவைலபிள் இன் டேர்ம்ஸ் ஆஃப் தி பை இன்ஃபர்மேட்டிக்ஸ் கம்யூனிட்டி வி சிங்க் தேர்ஸ் அ கேப் த கேப் ஹேஸ் டு டூ இஸ் அ ரிவர்ஸ் ப்ராசஸ் பைசா வி நோ த ஃபோர் ப்ராசஸ் ஹேஸ் பீங் ஹைலி ஆட்டோமேட்டட் அண்ட் வெரி யூ நோ வெல் இம்ப்ளிமெண்டட் ஹவர் திஸ் ரிவர்ஸ் ப்ராசஸ் ஐ சிங்க் has not been proposed uh, has been proposed conceptually but has not been implemented in any by informatic uh, tools in, in any high standard so this is what we sort of doing so we call this process of given a mutation reported at the protein level let's go back of the system and trying to identify what are the potential genomic mutations that is likely produce this protein level alteration right and people has been conceptually you know suspected this previously because we know this is a one to many relationship from the forward process but it's not a two way street uh, but but you know but what to understand the problem you need to build a two way street to our surprise there's a lot more mutations even though there are one mutation at the protein level they could correspond to multiple genomic mutations in the in the, you know in the, on the dna so this the landscape of this confusion was something that actually has been under uh estimated previously until we actually built a systematic tool which we call this tool transfer basically so this tool consists basically of three component we recapture edit previous four annotation process we basically reengineer that in our tool but we built two novel process which we define as reverse annotation as i just uh, described to you in the previous slides we also have a functionality called equivalent annotation so given up variant at protein level we want to know what are the other variants at protein level which would basically coming from the same genomic origin as, as the protein variants which you are given yes do we uh, know if uh, the equivalent uh, annotation as you uh, find it here implies equivalent functions of the protein there's a certainly at the protein level it's it's like it is set i mean if we want to talk about the molecule itself but we if we trying to talk about some other genomic associated property for example the likely the fold of the mutation uh, of of the protein and if we are trying to design functional experiment uh to target the dna which translates that protein those are the situation where this question become interesting i guess the molecule itself is uh, is uh, is identical but there's uh, a lot of implication in terms of uh, you know uh you Sorry, which molecule i mean like the pro- the protein egfr it's going to still be the same protein So yeah. Oh, okay. So protein and protein here are identical. No, no, no. Actually, oh, I, I was maybe I answered a slightly different question. Uh it's going to be a different protein actually. Right. Different different so isoforms. Yeah. Protein, yeah. Protein. What I trying to mention show here is that it's going to be a different protein. Okay. Probably the same gene but different um okay. amino acids are going to be altered. So basically. the question yeah. was yeah. protein versus protein. Are they going to be functionally equivalent? No, no, no. no. It's, it's going to be an entirely different uh, protein product in this right. situation. So yeah. in that case, uh, the significance of this third annotation is for experimental purposes. Uh, when we talk about two different proteins, it's certainly both for experimental purpose and also for translational purpose. So if I'm a clinician, when I say a variant at protein level, I better check if this protein has a different protein product which might result from the same genomic location as a, for me to better interpret the potential of function of this protein basically yeah. so you're talking about the isoform of the thing right isoform right yeah so so both proteins are transcribed from the same gene but yeah. they are alternative splicing rather than so yeah so that's yeah. the yeah. significance yeah. of yeah. the yeah. yeah yeah while while I was trying to describe to you there's a potential genomic problem property even if it's the same protein it could could matter as well which uh, 
that's a slightly different uh, perspective. But anyway, okay. So after we develop transfer, we have a tool for us to systematically search annotation that protein level and say how many genomic potential genomic origin each mutation protein mutation could have. And interestingly, even for the clinical actionable mutation of personalized cancer therapy, we find 40 percent of those mutations some are actually uh, seems to be important. Uh, actually have multiple potential genomic locations. Again, this number was uh, much higher than we previously anticipated. So that's just one. Uh, so we made this into our website just to for everybody to, particular clinician to use this more easily. For example, one of the functionality here is uh, is what we call the. Uh, uh, let's let me give you one example. Okay, this is the reverse annotation functionality. So if you, oh, actually this is the equivalence annotation functionality. If you give it a mutation a protein level, EGFR 790 mutation, and you choose reverse annotation here, and you choose different uh, transcript database, isoform database, and you do this reverse annotation, oh, equivalence annotation, it will tell you 790 is going to be equivalent to 745 and 7. 37 on different isoforms or uh, different transcripts. So this is a, this is going to be very efficient. Only take a few, few seconds for you to get this information now. Okay, and you can also do this so-called reverse annotation. So if you have this actionable mutation here, you give it to this website and you select different, again, different database here. It will tell you this mutation actually going to, can be, <coughs> can come from two different genomic uh, different, different genomic origin uh, through uh, two different transcripts. So that's, again, this is a reverse annotation. So luckily this actually, the importance of this were agreed by actually by nature methods. So we're able to publish on nature methods just by doing this relatively simple, bioinformatically simple thing. But I think because of the environment we have, the, the team work where we were able to work on the right problem, I guess, in a timely fashion. So, and this tool again, the open source is available at the Bitbucket. Uh, you can. This is a batch version where you can process uh, hundreds thousands of uh, input very quickly, and the web version is for low throughput, more user friendly uh, interaction. <coughs> uh, okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Probably have some time to quickly go. Uh, okay, let me quickly go over this third project I intended to tell you about. This is a more heavy duty genomic uh, discovery type of project. It's called Novo Break, where we're trying to identify this so called structural variation from cancer genomes. As we know, one of the important hallmark of cancer genome is not just point mutations or small indels. Frequently, we're talking about or imagine the mutations as uh, just one single and, uh, nucleotide uh, change. It's not the case in cancer genome. Frequently, we have lots of chromosomal uh, change. As shown here, this is a normal genome which consists of uh, 22, uh, 20, uh, three pair of uh, 22 uh, pair of autosomes and, and two sex chromosomes, and oftentimes they have uh, a size which are almost identical from you know, one individual to another individual. However, for an individual who got cancer, they frequently, their, their cancer cells genome is going to become much more different than their normal counterparts. Oftentimes, one chromosome, let's say chromosome one, is going to be duplicated or triplicated, you know, many times, and there's going to be chromosomal translocation, which involve uh, two pieces of different chromosome get stitched together in the cancer genome. So it's a really a very messy situation in the cancer genome. So many of those arrangement is actually functional. For example, we, I, I think even this group has, uh, has talked about the, for example, the for AML, there's a, a cases like, I can actually say AML, chronic myeloid leukemia, there's a clinical example which involved two, the fusion of BCR and ABL one uh, genes together. So that's a single driver of that particular disease and has been successfully targeted by uh, Gleevec, uh, you know, uh, 
treatment, and I think the response rate is very high if it's in early stage. 95% of patients are going to respond to the targeted therapy of that kind. So this is just uh, one example of uh, uh, detecting those type of events in, from cancer tissue has a very high potential translational impact. So that's one area where I spend a lot of uh, my uh, efforts on. So uh, different from toy mutation, this problem is computationally challenging because there's many type of a structural variation that could occur in the cancer genome. You could imagine sort of a deletion, duplication, or you know, insertion of a virus or uh, transposable elements into the genome. And there's different type of uh, fusion, which sometimes involve just one chromosome, but it could involve multiple chromosomes in one single uh, you know, events, in one single cell cycle. So how are we able to categorize this type of highly sort of a structurally uh, challenging type of a, a, a genotype from the, the cancer? So uh, previously, uh, so the entire genome community, for example, like the Genome uh, Sequencing Center at uh, Better College of Medicine, and also the genetic department at uh, Better College of Medicine, or a lot of them has been focused on this type of problem. They are, you know, you could call this genome assembly or genome alignment type of problem. So the technology has been used is this so-called uh, paired and sequencing technology. It's a, it's a nice technique where you, know, you can measure two points in the genome and their relationship, right? So if it's, if it's a normal situation, this two points is going to have an expected distance and uh, you know, orientation. However, if there's a rearrangement, something happened, one piece of chromosome gets stuck into another different chromosome, so this type of relationship will alter, right? Basically, now you have uh, just two points coming from two different chromosomes. Just imagine a fish, for instance, in sexual hybridization type of experiment where you can you know, look at different uh, relationship between, uh, between two dots. So, but it's much more complicated than I, my simplistic talking. And previously, I had a program called Breakdancer, which uh, basically automatically look at the alignment of uh, paired any reads to a reference genome to, be, uh, to identify those uh, patterns. This is a basically a pattern recognition type of problem. And what we find out uh, more recently is that that type of approach itself is not very sufficient. Uh, what's really unique in cancer genome are the basically the junctions at where they, uh, for example, the translocation occur. Let's say BCR ABR1 contain two genes fused together the real unique information is at the exact junction where those two genes get fused together. And that information only uniquely present in the tumor, but not in the normal. So that's a very powerful type of uh, signal we want to uh, focus our attention on. And realization of that also triggered us to develop the computational system in a very different way. For example, Standard approach will involve align the reads to a reference genome. However, if there's a sequence in the tumor which is very different from the normal reference genome, that sequence won't align to the reference genome. We, we won't be able to capture that type of information using the standard approach. What we should be doing is don't compare with the normal genome, just look at the tumor by itself and perform this so called de novo assembly approach, right? So, what we we're able to do uh, the two points I just talked about to trigger us to develop one type of uh, approach like this. We focus on this so-called camera approach. So as I show you here, we first look at the tumor data. It's lots and lots of uh, DNA uh, reads. We're able to basically fragment those into small pieces. And we're, we're able to figure out which pieces are coming from uh, because we're analyzing tumor and normal sequence at the same time, we're able to label, for example, this red pieces were you know, information from the tumor, and the blue pieces are information from the normal. And we're able to basically filter out information which already exists in the reference and does not represent a, a mutation. We're able to further filter out reads uh, you know, using the normal uh, tissue reads from the normal tissue as a control. 
and what's left over are only information uniquely present in the tumor genome, which are the red uh, fragment here. And use those red fragments as bait. We're able to basically go back and harvest the original data in the tumor genome, which are relevant to those baits. And, we're, and we then perform the de novo assembly of those information uh, to, to construct a new sequence which uniquely represents a new sequence in the tumor genome. Uh, presumably, those are the junction at the BCR ABR1 you know, uh, you know, junctions. So this is, a, again, a big data type of approach, uh, very highly computationally intensive, but we're able to basically uh, pull it out uh, through uh, software engineer, very relatively clear software engineering approach. And we're able to use this approach in the Dream Challenge, which are the sort of an international competition, you know, a computation group get together, analyze the same set of data, and compare their results to a gold standard, which oftentimes are the simulated, uh, you know, ground truth. And our approach is uh, drastically different from other group. Uh, they were still looking at the old paradigm of align rates to a reference, but we were sort of assemble rates, uh, sort of a, in a de novo fashion. So those are the frequently used other programs. So we're able to do a lot better in terms of sensitivity. Actually, not a whole lot better, probably 5% better in terms of sensitivity using our approach. And also nice, they be able to narrow down where exactly the breakpoint is. And this approach also did better than in to identify small indels, not just the big, big guys, but even for small indel, 10 to 50 base pair, uh, you know, small insertion deletion, we're able to do better than GAGK and also Straka. This was developed by Illumina company as their sort of a commercial uh, product. So we're able to do better than those. And just to, I have probably five minutes. Uh, very quick, oh, actually, do I even have five minutes? So this is a, just to give you one uh, recent case where we're able to apply our approach in a more translational setting. So this is one case that actually coming from Dr. Merrick Bernstein, the other one. <laughs> and it's a potentially Caucasian female with a, with a diagnosed with, a, has a phenotype which is consistent with this tumor called um, medullary thyroid carcinoma, MTC. And this individual does not have a germline mutation in this uh, gene, which were you know, used for genomic testing of, uh, to tell whether this uh, cancer was a hereditary uh, tumor or it's a sporadic tumor. So this is a potential has a sporadic MTC and, he ha and she has multiple metastasized at the time of diagnosis or in the course of the treatment. And, and unfortunately, this individual died after uh, 10 months of uh, treatment. And in the process, targeted therapy was applied. And there was some initial response to the targeted therapy, but only lasted one cycle. And uh, so those are the sort of the story uh, happened in this uh, particular case. And we're trying to sort of look at case Richards uh, respectively and per including the genomic data to understand the, the, the information. So do you have a question? No. Okay. Okay, so the data we had was from actually from Foundation Medicine. I, I don't know at what stage this Foundation Medicine, which is a panel sequence and data, uh, involve about uh, 200 genes, including some uh, intronic region, not just exonic region on our panel. And uh, this test itself, I guess, probably costs about 5000 to $8,000, sometimes covered by insurance, but most time don't cover by insurance. But we get this data from Foundation Medicine, and I was fortunate enough to look at this data. <laughs> Thanks for uh, Dr. Merrick Bernstein. <laughs> this was an email from me. 2013, and uh, to you know, uh, to colleagues, my clinical colleagues, and were able to identify uh, fusion or uh, translocation involved those two genes, uh, MYH13 and RAT, basically. So this is the original email where you know you can see those are the sequence I were able to assemble from the raw data, and in the middle, this section were capitalized. 
that's where the junctions are in this particular location. So the p point of showing those slides of those were actually for me, it's many years of uh, software development. But not until I were able to involve in this project, I was able to apply my 10 years of <laughs> bioinformatics development to something that's actually going to be potentially useful. Not even in this case though, but we're able to at least able to identify something uh, which we further validated through RT, uh, PCR, resequencing the RNA of this patient's tumor tissue, and we, as well as the fish experiment, we're able to validate the existence of these events in the patient tumor tissue, and we were able to further perform some functional assay. If you remember what I talked about at the beginning, trying to look at the cell viability, we transfect the cell line with this particular translocation or fusion in comparison with some wild type control. We're able to see this particular translocation has much stronger uh, you know, cell viability compared with the console, controls. And it's as strong as some other positive control we have uh, you know, from previous uh, data. And also we measured this translocation indeed can be uh, targeted and re by this drug which we apply to that particular patient is responsible, sensitize the cell line to this particular drug. So both of those pieces of information gave us stronger indicator this is truly the driver mutation in that particular individual even though we, you know, we cannot be 100% sure but this is as far as we can get uh, given the resource we have. Okay, so this is the program which uh, I just described. It's also under review, this manuscript, again, also by Nature Methods, and this uh, source code are uh, public available. Okay, that's a summary of what I talked about today. I mean, I'd like to just make one argument. I think this field, precision medicine and big data, actually creates lots of opportunities. And I was able to identify lots of bioinformatics gaps, as I, as I just illustrated today. Uh, and we're able to fortunately pull it off with the resource I were able to access at MD Anderson and also support from lots of colleagues uh, uh, in the UT uh, generally. So just a quick acknowledgement of uh, researchers in my group, uh, in my department of bioinformatics, and also uh, in Institute of Personalized Cancer Therapy, uh, and also since I've here, <laughs> in the right UT. Okay, okay, that's fine. <laughs> okay, you know, you know, it wasn't intentional, but anyway. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anyway, so that's a that's a uh, talk I'd like to give today. I don't know if we have time for a question or not, but feel free to talk to me now or afterwards. Well, that's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for that last patient, did you guys go back and check the tumor again, or manage that tumor again? Why the patient become less responsive to that drug? I yeah, that's a good question. We I don't think that was has been looked at. Yeah, I, I guess the clinician I've been working with must have thought about that question, but maybe potentially because of the limitation of the data, because foundation medicine is only a panel. Uh, it has limited discovery power for the resistant, potential resistant mutations. So, so I, I have to 